He came to love, heal and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because he lives. tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives, but greater still the calm assurance this child can face certain days because he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because You're taking your Bibles and turning to Genesis chapter 21. Our congregation is reading through the Bible together this year. There is a five-day reading plan if you'd like to read Monday through Friday, and then also a seven-day reading plan if you want to read consecutively for seven days. Both are up on our church website. Um, you arrive at the same place at the end of the week, though you do a little more reading during the day each day if you're using the five-day plan. And so we're all at the same place at the weekend and this morning, what I'm doing, as I'm doing throughout the year, is I'm taking a text then that we've read in that week, and I'm preaching on it as an encouragement for us to keep our reading. Let me just say this, and I say this often to you. Um, if you if you miss a day, you, you skip a day, you can't get to a day, um, don't feel badly about that. Be thankful for what you do, not for what you don't do. Uh, the purpose of this is not to get through the Bible as much as it is for the Bible to get through you. Uh, that's the point, to be saturated in this uh, meta-narrative of the scripture that we see so beautifully here in Genesis chapter number 21. 
so you can get the five-day plan, get the seven-day plan. Many of you are using uh, one of the two of those. Uh, read through the scripture with us, and then again on Sunday, I'm taking a passage that we've read that week and just reiterating the passage, reminding us about what God is doing in the world and encouraging you to read through the scripture also. So this morning, Genesis chapter 21, if you'll take your scriptures, and we're going to read through verse number 21, actually, all right? So Genesis 21, 1 to 21, here's what the word of the Lord says to us. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse his children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. And the idea there is mocking. So she said to Abraham, verse 10, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son Ishmael. But God said to Abraham, be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So, verse 14, Abraham rose early in the morning, and he took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water skin was gone, verse 15, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, let me not look on the death of the child. They're starving and thirsting in the desert. And she assumes they're going to die. As she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy, and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God, verse 20, was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran and with his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. This is a fantastic chapter in the scripture as all the texts in the scripture are fantastic. But this is a chapter of birth and a chapter of life in the midst of a book that thus far after Cain's murder has really been a book of death. We've seen the effect of sin and how that people after people and person after person is dying. In the middle of this now, a son, a child of promise is born. Now, you all know this child was vaguely promised in Genesis chapter 12 and verses 1 through 3 when God made a covenant with Abraham. There in chapter 12, God said to Abraham, I'm going to make of you a great nation. Well, in order for a great nation to be brought of Abraham, we'd assume that he has to have a son. So there's a vague promise of a child there. But specifically in verses, chapter 17 and 18, God comes to Abram and he comes to Sarah and he says to them, you are going to have a son. Remember the Sarah almost laughed mockingly. She laughed kind of like, really, that's going to happen? And yet in chapter 21, about 25 years after the promise was made, 
And that's important for those of us who've been praying for things for a long time. About 25 years after the promise was made, this child, Isaac, is born. And the part that we read this morning divides very easily into two sections. There's the, the, the birth of Isaac, and then equally as important, there's the expulsion of Hagar and Ishmael. And we're going to talk about that also. But here's three things I want to see from this passage. First one is this. You see it in verses 1 through 7. God keeps his promises. Now, that may seem fundamental, but it's important that we understand that God keeps his word. Verse 1 says, the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. That's important. Verse 2 says, she conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time that God had spoken to him. That's important. This is not a small bump in the road in the book of Genesis or from Genesis to Revelation. In fact, this is the basis of the Old Testament. The basis of the Old Testament is the promise of a son who is delivered in the New Testament in the person of Jesus. So that's really the whole Old Testament is this idea of promise. And what we see in chapter 21 is that God keeps his promise. Now, I want you to see this, and I, I think you're going to see it. You're kind of going to go, I mean, I want this to be, remember when they came to get Jesus in, in the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus spoke, and, and just by the word of his voice, the soldiers were thrust back and fell to the ground. They kind of like went, wow, that's what I want this chapter to be. I want this chapter to be a kind of, wow, I can't believe that sort of moment. Because what we see in Genesis 21 in the small story of Isaac right here and the expulsion of Hagar and Ishmael is in reality both of the Testaments, the Old and the New Testament. In this one small story, we see the whole story of what God is doing in the Bible. And that's the point of reading through the Bible. When we read through the Bible, we see that every one of the smaller stories really just reinforces the bigger story of the Scripture so that by the time we get to the Revelation, we've read the same story just with different characters a hundred, two hundred, three hundred times so that it's getting deep into our psyche. This first point, God keeps his word. We see it again and again and again in the Old Testament. God keeps his word. Why is that important? Well, that's important because now that Christ has come, God has made certain promises to us about death, about life, about heaven. And we want to know that we can count on God, that God keeps his word. Well, we have a whole record of the Old Testament where God has done that. God has kept his word again and again and again. And that's the point of reading through the scripture, just to build this deep, to let it dwell richly in us. Our God is a God who keeps his word. And he does so, as in the birth of Jesus, he does now in the birth of Isaac, miraculously. Our God is a God that when everything looks as though it's against him and against his cause and against us is a God who miraculously comes through. Think about God's ability in Sarah and Abraham's inability. Um, Sarah had no children of her own. She was past childbearing years. Abraham was past child giving years. Um, and so what Sarah did was she said to Abraham, God's made you this promise that you're going to have a child, so I want you to go into Hagar and have a child with Hagar, and we'll count him as our son. The fact of the matter is, though, after Hagar had Ishmael, Sarah became jealous of Hagar and jealous of Ishmael. That, that, that didn't work out. We, we do this, don't we? God makes us a promise. God says he's going to do something, and we kind of weary of waiting on the Lord, so we sort of try to fix it ourselves. We get involved ourselves. Ever gotten between someone that God is working in their lives to try to circumvent? You know, God, you're not working fast enough. God, you're not working smoothly enough. God, you're not doing this my way. So I'm going to kind of jump in there in the flesh and try to make happen what God has promised is going to happen. That's exactly what Sarah's done. She's kind of jumped in the way. Well, God has promised us this, but hey, it's been a number of years. God hasn't come through. I'll tell you how we can fix this. I'll come up with a plan. She hatched a plan. Abraham, you go into Hagar. You'll have Ishmael. Life will be great. And indeed, Abraham went in had to Hagar and had Ishmael, but life wasn't good. It's what I call the Hagarian effect. The Hagarian effect. Now listen to me. I mean this seriously. Now listen to me. There are some of you and you're not Christians. And you're doing your best to live the Christian life. 
you're reading the Bible and you're giving money and you're cutting out all the bad words from your vocabulary and you've stopped kicking the dog and you've kept kicking the cat, which is only righteousness. And, you know, you're doing all these things that Christians need to do. But for you, Christianity is kind of a treadmill. There's no, let's put it this way, there's no gas in the engine and you're pushing the car. And for you, Christianity is work. It's effort. It's not about what you're gleaning or what you're receiving. It's about what you're giving. It's hard. It's laborious. To come to church is laborious. It's like, yeah, I got to go. Okay, I'm going to go. To read your Bible, to pray, to fellowship with other believers. Listen to me. The problem with doing things by the flesh is not that they don't work. It's that they do work. Abraham went into Hagar and it worked. But what it produced was confusion. What it produced was heartache. What it produced is hard feelings. What it produced is schism in the family. What you need is the gas in your engine. What you need is the Holy Spirit living in you, producing the life of Christ in you so that you're not just externally trying to do all the things a Christian does, but Christ himself in you by the Holy Spirit is actually living the life of Christ in you. That's Christianity. Christianity is not repression. I'm not doing these things. Christianity is expression. It's the life of Christ by the Holy Spirit being lived out in me. I just say that to those of you who are finding Christianity to be dull or boring or effort or work all the time. I'm not trying to make you doubt your Christianity, but I am saying if that's true of you, you might consider whether you're doing things in a Hagarian kind of way and without the Spirit because God is going to come along, is he not to Sarah? And miraculously, God is going to provide Abraham and Sarah a child. You see, God is going to do in a miraculous way, a supernatural way, what Abraham and Hagar and Sarah tried to do in a very natural way. But this is going to produce a son who's the son of promise, who's in the line of Jesus, who's going to provide redemption. That's what you get when you're doing things in the spirit, if you will. God not only gave Sarah a son, but gave her a son when he said he would give her a son. That was hard to wait on God to do what God said that he would do. But God, we learn from this story, We learn from multiple other stories already in the book of Genesis. We learn from reading the book of Job, because we've already read Job, since Job is a contemporary of Abraham's. We've already read through the book of Job as well. God always keeps his word. He always keeps his promise. In fact, Paul said in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, you'll see it on the screen, we have this hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. How do I know that I have eternal life? I know that I have eternal life not because of what I have done, but because of what God has done and God is doing. And God always keeps his word. Listen, there'll come a point in time when you as a Christian, maybe Alzheimer's or maybe some physical disability, you're not able to get up and go and do You're not able to think as clearly as you once did. Maybe you can't pray. Maybe you can't read your scripture. Maybe you can't attend church anymore. Does your salvation fall when your mind fails? Does your salvation quit when your body fails? No, because our salvation isn't dependent upon what we've done. Our salvation is dependent upon what God has done in Christ on the cross and what God is doing through us by his spirit. We have eternal life because God, who cannot lie, has promised it before the world began and God always keeps his word. That's what I get from Genesis chapter 21. Could be 25 years, could be 12 years, could be two years, could be a longer period of time, but God always keeps his word and does it in such a way that look with me in verse number six. They named this child laughter, which means son of my, I name him Isaac, which means son of my laughter because Sarah says, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears about this will laugh over me, and it hasn't always been that way. People have laughed at Sarah. We live in that kind of world, don't we? We live in a world where we want a a world minus grace, 
where we want to feel better than other people and look better than other people and be better than other people. And so when somebody doesn't have what we have, we kind of mock them, we sort of laugh at it. And that had happened to Sarah for who knows how many years she's not been able to produce a child for Abraham. And people have literally laughed at her. It's like Ishmael laughing at Isaac now that he's born. This has been Sarah's history. People have laughed at her. That's why she takes it so personal when somebody laughs at her son at this party that's given in Isaac's honor. Ishmael laughs at him. And Sarah takes it very personally because she's lived a life of reproach. She's lived a life of want. She's lived a life of longing. She's lived a life of unanswered prayer. Everybody else else's children in the church are Christians and not hers. Everybody else's husband in the church is a Christian and not hers. Everybody else's life in the church has turned out well and not hers. And she's felt this reproach for years. So when Isaac is born, in fact, they name him son of my laughter. And Sarah says, oh, look what God has done. Now everybody will laugh with me and laugh for me. What's the application of this, that God always keeps his word? Well, historically, remember, Moses has written the book of Genesis, and he's reading it to the people of Israel as they wander in the wilderness. This is, this is really hugely important. Jo Moses is reading this book, because this book, for 430 years, They've had the Egyptian gods as their god. Moses has written Genesis, and he said, no, no, let me tell you who the real God is. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. Well, they'd learned that the Egyptian gods had made the earth through some weird mechanism. And, God, and Moses said, no, no, God just spoke the world into existence. So what's happening is as they're going through the Exodus, Moses has written the book of Genesis, and he's redefining God for them. He's redefining who they are for them. He's redefining their relationship to them. Now watch, now watch. God has made Israel certain promises promises in the wilderness. You, you'll see it on the screen. Joshua 1, 1 through 2. After the death of Moses, the one who wrote this book of Genesis, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. What does that mean for Israel? What does that mean for the relationship to God? Oh no, God is a God who keeps his promises. Now therefore arise, go over the Jordan, into the, you and all this people, into the land, watch this, that I'm giving you, that I'm giving you. Verse three, every place the sole of your foot will tread upon, I've given to you, just as I promised to Moses. Why is it important for Israel to read the book of Genesis during the Exodus and know that God is a promise-keeping God? The reason it's important to them is because God has promised them that watch miraculously. They're going into a land that has seven nations militarily prepared for them to invade. And, and who is Israel? Well, they've been farmers. You know, they've kept cattle and sheep for 400 years. And now they're coming into a land that's I mean, think about Jericho with walled fortresses. How are they going to take this? It's, it's literally impossible for them to win this land, except that God said, you're not going to take the land. I'm going to give you the land. Just like I promised I would give Abraham and Sarah a child and did so miraculously, I'm going to give you I know it looks impossible. You're just farmers. I understand that. These people have got armies. I understand that. But remember when I gave, I, I gave Abraham and Sarah a child and it was physically impossible for them to have a child? Guess what? When you come against Jericho, I just walk around at one time a day, seven days, seventh day, six days, seventh day, walk around at seven times. It'll all be done. And it happens just like God promised. It's important for Israel to read these words as they're wandering in the wilderness so that they have faith in God that when they get to the edge of the promised land, God will do what he promised. He'll give them the land miraculously, just like he gave Abraham and Sarah a child miraculously. See, it's, this, this is important historically. It's important personally because there are equally times in our lives when life is against us and we can hear only mockery or hurt and we face impossible situations. And many of us, as I mentioned earlier, we've been praying about things for years, just banging on the door of heaven. You know, we're kind of like Lewis, as I mentioned last week, saying the heavens are brass, the door is shut, the lights are out, there's no one there. And we're calling out to God about something. And it seems as though the Lord is uninterested. 
ignorant of what's going on in our lives. And yet from this, we understand that when we don't see God working and don't even believe that God is working, God is working. God always keeps his word. This is important messianically. It's important historically, personally, messianically. Because Mary, the mother of Jesus, is going to be faced with an impossible situation. She's going to look at Gabriel and said, time out. How can I have a baby? I've not been with a man. And Gabriel's going to look at her in Luke 137 and say, with God, nothing. Hey, let me tell you a time that Abraham and Sarah wanted a child, and he was 100, and she was 90, and God gave them a child. Wasn't that a miracle? Yeah. Well, guess what, Mary? You have a miracle working God. With God, nothing will be impossible. Listen, this is important historically. It's important personally. It's important messianically. It's important universally because listen to me, listen to me. We live in a world, we live in a nation that has state-sponsored death. I'm not speaking for or against universal health care. But I am saying that universal health care, as it is being proposed, may require that all Americans fund abortion through their taxes. That's state-mandated culture of death. We live in an era in which uh, a movie star, a female movie star, gets up on stage and has erased the word abortion, simply says, I committed murder, and people applaud her. We live in a world, and this is not to say something against, listen, we've all sinned. Abortion is a sin. But let's not qualify them, if you will, and say one's worse than the other, so to speak. This is not to speak against the people who are having abortions. It is to speak against abortion, which is murder. It's wrong in the sight of God. Watch this. We live in a world where that is acceptable in the same way Do you remember when Jesus was on the earth and he walked on the earth and when he met dead people, they came back to life? When Jesus walked on the earth, you all know this, but let me just say it for those of you who are guests. When Jesus walked on the earth, Jesus reviewed what Eden was like before the fall because everywhere he went, sickness was healed. Everywhere he went, life relationships were restored. Think about Zacchaeus, relationships being restored. Everywhere he went, life was made perfect. He reviewed what life was like before Eden, and he previewed what life will be like in the New Jerusalem, because in the New Jerusalem, Revelation teaches us there's no more dying or sickness or sin or there's no more crying, you know, that kind of thing. Everywhere Jesus went, Jesus was the model for what the kingdom of God looks like. In other words, it isn't natural for people to die. That's subnatural. It's natural for us to live forever. This is the intent of God, and God has made it so in Christ that we live forever. But after Adam and Eve sinned, you saw it. Cain murders Abel. We get to Genesis 5, and it's a litany, just a list of death after death after death after death, and that's what the world has become. It's become a culture of death, and in the midst of that death, this son is born, and from this son in his line will come the son who promises eternal life to all who repent and believe on him. In the midst of this culture of death comes life, and that's important for you and for me because we are presently living in a world where we could be living off the echo of the Judea. Christian ethic, but not actually. Not actually. We live in a world that is a world that better resembles Genesis and death than a world of the revelation and joy. And sometimes if you watch the news or if you read the newspaper or if you listen to friends about what's going on in the world, It can be really discouraging. Man, the world's just, you know, gone to whatever you would say. It's a terrible place. Yes, yes, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. Perhaps it's not the way it was. But here's the promise of God. It's not the way it will be either. And God is doing what? Reconciling all things to himself. He's restoring it as the former with more. 
with more. God is reconciling all things to himself. In the midst of the hurt and heartache that we experience in this life, we need to remember that God keeps his promises. It's important for Israel to know this. It's important for Mary to know this. It's important for us to know this. It's important for the world to hear this message of potential reconciliation with God through Jesus Christ, that life can be ours in Christ. And let me tell you why that's important. It's important because of what happens next in this chapter. Now watch, I want you to see this. I want you to just see this with me. Because this is the whole Bible right here in Genesis 21, 1 to 21. In the first seven chapters, we have the birth of the seven, first seven verses, we have the birth of a child. From 8 to 21, we have inclusion or exclusion dependent on your relationship. To that child. Now you think with me. You're either in or you're out because of how you're related to Isaac. That's what happens here. At verse 8, a conflict reemerges in Abraham's family. Hagar, for the second time, but this time not of her own choosing, is going to leave the family. This time Abraham expels Hagar and Ishmael from the family. Ishmael's about 14 years old right now. And you can imagine that Hagar would walk him out, maybe on a little precipice of a cliff and look out over the cattle and and the, the sheep and the land and the rivers flowing. And she would say, Hagar would say to Ishmael, son, one day all of this is yours. Because Sarah ain't having any children. She's 90 years old. She's not having children. You're Abraham's son. Hagar or Ishmael, one day this is yours. Hagar would say, day after day after day for 14 years. And then Isaac is born. And the scripture says, look with me at verse 8, when he was weaned, Abraham made a great feast for him. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she'd born to Abraham, laughing or mocking. And so she said to Abraham, you get rid of this woman. And verse 11 says, it grieved Abraham so much. 14 years this boy has been his only boy. Think with me. Think with me about how it worked. Watch. Think with me about how it worked. When God in Genesis 11 called Abram to leave from um, his land and go into, the, into a new land, remember that Abraham took Lot with him. Why? Why did he take Lot? Well, the reason he took Lot is because he's an old man and he and Sarah don't have any children. And if he's going to have an heir, it's going to be his nephew. It's going to be Lot's child. But at some point, God says to Abraham, you separate yourself from Lot. God, what am I going to do? In fact, Abraham complains to God and says, Eliezer, my servant, will now be my heir. And God says, no, he won't. And he separates Abraham from Eliezer. God, what am I going to do? I need an heir. So then God gives him Ishmael. And he says, oh, Ishmael will be my heir. And God says, no, he won't. And God separates him from Ishmael. You think with me. By the time, this is, this is why it's so pronounced, this is why it's so big, in the next chapter, when God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him on Moriah. Abraham is remembering all the potential sons that he could have had, and now it's come down to one. And God wants him to sacrifice him? The confusion in Abraham's mind that God reinforces what Sarah says when Sarah says, I don't want Hagar and Ishmael here anymore. He will not be your heir. You get rid of them. And verse 11 says it grieved Abraham. So much so, in fact, that God had to show up and say, Abraham, you do what Sarah has told you to do. And Hagar and Ishmael are now separated from the family. What's important at this point is that Moses is using Sarah's words to remind Israel of what God has promised concerning the seven nations. I'm not going to ask you to turn there, but in Psalm chapter 83, 
when God says that the seven nations are against Israel coming into the promised land, he names the seven nations as being of the families of Lot and Ishmael. That strife that was occurring in that family, that's just not a family issue. That's a global issue between believers and unbelievers. Psalm 83 exposes the attitude of the descendants of Israel. They're still, uh, the descendants of Ishmael, they're still in opposition to Israel. And when you come to the New Testament, I want you to do me a favor, if you will. Take your Bible and turn to Galatians. Hold Genesis 21 and take your Bible and turn to Galatians chapter 4 because we're not finished with this yet. This distinction between Isaac and Ishmael isn't simply familial. It's not just about two women. It's not just about two boys. It has deep spiritual significance in the past for Israel entering Canaan where God says that animosity still exists and the future where God is going to separate believers from unbelievers. Galatians 4, 28 to 31. Now you brothers, like Isaac, all of those of you who believe, you're the children of promise. But just at that time, he who was born according to the flesh, Ishmael, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, Isaac, so it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the sons of the free woman. So brothers, we are not the children of the slave, but of the free. What is Paul saying? Let me tell you what he's saying. He's saying it's no wonder that the Jews in the temple persecute you. It's no wonder that unbelievers are persecuting you. This has been going on since Isaac and Ishmael. This has been going on forever. But here's what we're promised. We're promised that one day, just like Isaac was separated from Ishmael, so one day God is going to separate all believers from unbelievers. That's what he's saying. Nonetheless, they're going to be cast out, just as they were cast out in God keeps his promises. And if God has promised, listen to me, friend. If you're here as an unbeliever, you're not a Christian, and you're reading through the Bible, and you're seeing a chapter like 21, where after 25 years and miraculously, God keeps his word, that should concern you because God has promised one day to separate believers from unbelievers and unbelievers to be cast eternally from his presence in hell. That should concern you. You say, well, I'm, I'm 40 years old, I'm 50 years old, I'm 60 years old, I haven't died yet, God hasn't done anything yet. Yeah, that's what Sarah and Abraham said in the 10th year and in the 12th year, and in the 15th year, and in the 18th year, and then in the 24th year. But in the 25th year, she's pregnant and having a baby. Listen to me, friends. God keeps his word. And if you're here as an unbeliever, this is a demonstration. This is a picture that one day God is going to separate believers and unbelievers. Now, back to Genesis chapter 21. Abraham loves Ishmael. He loves Ishmael. In, in fact, so much so, go with me to chapter 17. Look at Genesis chapter 17. God said to Abram, this is where in Genesis 12, he prophesied the son generically. In 17 and 18, he prophesied the son specifically. Genesis 17, 15 and 19. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. Moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said, Shall a child be born to a man who's 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And this is what Abraham said in response to God's promise. Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, No. It's about 14 years. Abraham loves this boy. As far as Abraham knows, this child is going to be his heir. He's, he's grooming him. He's getting him ready to take over everything when he dies. And God comes to him again like with Lot and like with Eliezer and now with Ishmael and says, No, I'm going to miraculously give you a child. Now listen to me. God, listen to me. God loves Ishmael. Ishmael is not the child of promise, 
but Abraham loves him. He's his child in the same way that God loves the world, Jews and Gentiles, believers and unbelievers, and makes it rain on the just and the unjust. No, I want you to see something with me. Look at 21, 12 to 14. Go back to chapter 21. Look at 12 to 14. Sarah sees Ishmael laugh at Isaac. I don't know, maybe he walked funny or he didn't say his R's when he was a kid or who knows what it was. But Ishmael laughs at Isaac and Sarah takes it personally, right? She's lived a life of people laughing at her because she doesn't have a child. She takes this very personally. She looks at Abraham and says, you've got to get rid of Hagar and Ishmael. Get rid of them. And Abraham, the Bible says it grieved Abraham. Verse 11 of 21, it grieved Abraham. Verse 12, but God said to Abraham, do not be displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah tells you to do is she tells you, for through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Do this. Now watch verse 13. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning, took bread and a skin of water, gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. As the story closes, Abraham is providing for Hagar and Ishmael, unlike Sarah. Sarah's just, they're unbelievers. Let them go to hell. They're unbelievers, send them out in the wilderness, who cares? They're unbelievers, they're not really part of our family, it's not our responsibility. But Abraham is grieved over the son who is not the son of promise, this unbeliever, he's grieved. Look at 15 to 19, God cares for Hagar and Ishmael more than Sarah does and more than Abraham can. When the water in the skin was gone, and that had to happen because they're wandering out in the desert, Abraham gave him what he could, but he could only give him so much. She put the child under one of her bush, under the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off. She said, I don't want to watch the baby die. We're going to die. And she sat opposite him. She lifted up her voice and wept, and God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy. Take him up, hold him fast. I'll make him a great nation. Verse 19, then she opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. Look at verse 20. And God was with the boy. Now watch, first part of the chapter is the birth of a child. Second part of the chapter is inclusion or exclusion depending on your relationship to the child. And Hagar is not related to Isaac. And Sarah hates Ishmael and they send them off. That's a picture of both testaments, the coming of the son and the judgment that's yet to come the separation that's going to transpire. But this is what I want you to see. God is concerned for Hagar. And God is concerned for Ishmael. Whereas Abraham provides him a flask of water, God provides him a well. The Lord is the true sovereign. God is the God. He is the God. In the same way that God is going to separate the seven nations from Israel when they get into the promised land is the same way that he has separated Hagar and Ishmael from Isaac and Abraham. Is the same way he's going to separate unbelievers eventually from believers. But in the interim, God's care of Hagar and of Ishmael should burden us. It should burden us. Sometimes we don't like to be around unbelievers, and we don't like unbelievers. Their worldview is different, and they talk differently, and they act differently, and their, their words are, and it's just like, wow, really? Sometimes we're Sarah with Hagar and Ishmael. 
and said of God with Hagar and Ishmael. He is not the son of promise, but God cares for him nonetheless. And God watches over him nonetheless. If you've got a King James, she names the, the, uh, the well something like uh, La Rohai, which means God sees. Because God saw Hagar and saw the boy. And the idea is that God sees the whole of Ishmael's life. This should burden us. I, I know it does me. When I read this and saw that Abraham was burdened over the loss of Ishmael, even though he wasn't an elect, if you will, even though he wasn't a child of promise, and then that God cared so much for Ishmael, it broke my heart to say, wow, I don't know that I'm that concerned about unbelievers. This, 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 Take your Bible and turn to Matthew 25. This separation, this breaking right here, this, this segregation, Matthew in the New Testament 25, just like Isaac is the child of promise, is a prefiguring of Christ who is to come as a child of promise, so this segregation that occurs right now in Genesis 21 is also a segregation that is going to occur. That's why I say in every smaller story, we get previews, ideas of the big story, so that in reality, as we read through the Bible, we're reading the same story again and again and again. God is burning it into our minds and our hearts. Matthew 25, 31 to 34, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he'll sit on his glorious throne. Behold him, be gathered all the nations, and he'll separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Verse 41, then he'll say to those on his left, depart from you, cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Just as God kept his word for Isaac to be born, Jesus makes this promise. This is coming to pass, friends. This is going to happen. But I'm saying to us as believers in the interim, let us show compassion. Let us show concern. Let us love as God loved Hagar, as God loved Ishmael, as God cared for them. So let us care for and minister to and love, if you will, the unbeliever. Ishmael had no more control over his birth than an unbeliever does over theirs. Love the ungodly. Pray for the ungodly. Trust God with the ungodly. And know that just as Isaac was promised and came, so Christ has been promised and come. The ultimate promised son is Christ himself. This is why John, and this is important. We're going to get to Genesis chapter 22, next chapter. You've, some of you already read it. I won't preach on it next week, but some of you already read it. And God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him on the mount. And that's why John, when he writes John 3, 16, frames it in those words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. There is no Lot. There is no Eleazar. There is no Ishmael. There's only one son through whom God is promising his son. There's only one people whom God is blessing with eternal life. There's only one person, Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among people whereby we must be saved. Only the name of Jesus, just as it came down to Isaac or no one. So it comes down to Jesus or no one. Oh, Christian friend, God keeps his word. Just as God kept his word to Abraham and Sarah, God will keep his word to you. I, I don't know the time, but God will keep his word. Unbelieving friend, 
You may be 15 years old or 18 years old or 40 years old or 60 years old, and you may say, I've gotten away with it so far, but God keeps his word. And the segregation that occurs in this family after the birth of Isaac is a prophecy of the segregation that is eventually going to occur at the end of time where God separates the unbelievers from the believer. And God keeps his word about that. And if you'll read along with us in the Old Testament, you'll see time and time and time again that Jesus, Jesus is the ultimate proof that God keeps his word for both the believer and the unbeliever. Well, we're going to sing. We're going to rejoice in this promise-keeping God. We're going to lavish our praise on Him. We're going to have a word of prayer, asking God to break the hearts of those of you who are here who don't know Christ as your Savior, that you would repent. That's what the Bible calls it. Repent of trying to get to heaven your own way, doing things your own way, and Place your faith in Christ and in Christ alone. Just as Abraham had to give away his faith in Lot and give away his faith in Eleazar and give away his faith in Ishmael, you're being called to give away your faith in everything else and place it only in the ultimate Isaac, who is Jesus. Well, let's pray together. Father, would you make it so? Would you take it such as you strip away all other things and let us see Jesus and Jesus alone? And I pray that people who are here this morning, they're pushing the car because it's got no gas in it. Christianity is laborious to them. There's no joy. It's a matter of I have to do. Would you let them see, Father, they're doing things like Abraham and Hagar did. They're doing things in a natural way and not a supernatural way. What they need to do is just repent and trust Jesus and ask Jesus to live the Christian life through them. I pray that unbelievers here this morning will do that. And those who aren't even trying to live the Christian life, they're just unconcerned about it at all, I pray you'd let them look in this chapter and see a son is born, a separation is made. And that that separation will be made based on your relationship to the son. Have you trusted Jesus as your savior and that you'd awaken the hearts of unbelievers. You'd give them sight and give them life. Oh, I pray it, Father. I pray it in Jesus' name. And help us as Christians, as Abraham did for Hagar and Ishmael, as God did for Hagar and Ishmael. Help us to have compassion, mercy, tenderheartedness toward those who are outside of faith, toward unbelievers. Help us to give them a little water and a little bread and tell them about Christ who is the well of living water and the bread such that people don't hunger again. Spirit of God, take this passage in Genesis 21 and do all of these things in your church. I pray it for the name of that ultimate son who is Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing.
See.